everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered whether positive thoughts work or if focusing on happiness does more harm than good, then do we have the new thought show for you. Today I'll be talking with Mitch Horowitz, Penn Award-winning historian and one of the true behind-the-scenes leaders in the New Thought movement today. He's the author, co-author, and editor of way too many books to mention here, and a <laughs> favorite of mine, One Simple Idea. Today we'll be talking about losing the war on unhappiness, what it means, what we can do about it, and how we can still use positive thinking to help transform our lives. That plus we'll talk about what's wrong with the law of attraction, what in the world happened with the secret, challenging moves to Long Island, where to find pink heart-shaped buckets, and <laughs> <laughs> what in the world Norman Vincent Peale has to do with today, literally. So welcome back to the show, Mitch. Are you ready to shine? Yes, thank you. And thank you for wearing a t-shirt today. I know our audio listeners can't see it, but when the video link is up, I'm, I'm honored that you're dressed in a t-shirt for this occasion. So I have never worn a t-shirt for the show. I know you always wear some very hip and cool t-shirts. What's today's? Oh, uh, Yodorevsky, uh, the filmmaker and esotericist. And I'm holding it up. The video folks will be able to see it later on. It's designed with the logo of um, the band, the heavy metal band, the Scorpions. But it's the name Yodorevsky. And uh, there's an artist here in New York who dedicated a series of T-shirts to his favorite film directors. Mm -hmm. But for each director, he uses the logo of a different rock band. So, for example, for Brian De Palma, he uses Def Leppard. Um, for La Lars von Trier, he uses Van Halen. And so on and so forth. So today's is Yodorevsky. So this is the, now. Now I'm able to because we've had you on several times. I think yeah. I've seen several other iterations or or oh, parts of his collection. Could be, could be. I, I have almost all of them. I, I quite love them. And T-shirts are all I own, so that's why I was expressing my gratitude to you for wearing one today. I, I just got this from Jessica. She just came back from the Philippines and uh, Taiwan, and this is a Tarzir. It's, it's got these giant googly eyes. This is the world's smallest mammal. Oh, that okay. Is, is, right. is what I'm wearing, but it's it's larger than life eyes. Very I nice. felt we needed to bring a little bit of a light to things right. today, a little fun, kind of a little day. levity to the situation. Right, right, right. You wrote a blog post recently about kind of uh, surrendering that the, the, the war against unhappiness has been yeah. lost. And I'm wondering, why are people saying positive psychology is dangerous? Yeah. Well, they're saying it because they're hearing other people say it. And we have a groupthink mentality. Perhaps it's human nature. And as soon as one cognitive psychologist says something, another cognitive psychologist wants to um, apply for a grant and see if he or she can get the same degree of attention. So... Mm -hmm. The field of cognitive psychology at the moment is on a little bit of a tear in devising often very flawed, very limited, very, I would say, almost casually slapped together experiments intended to disprove the efficacy of positive thinking. And... It, these experiments tend to create appealing headlines, mm -hmm. which a reporter can usually boil down into things like the powerlessness of positive thinking or the, 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 the power of positive piffle or you know, just to quote two recent headlines that I came across. But if one reads these experiments, as I have and mm -hmm. as I've written about in my piece, Losing the War on Unhappiness, I have links to some articles where I've considered some of these experiments in greater detail. They're very minor. They're very poorly structured. And very often they don't prove at all what the headlines say they do, that positive thinking is bad for you or that positive thinking actually results in negative outcomes. And the researchers themselves concede as much. The researchers themselves concede as much if you read the studies. What they usually find is that there's a problem with what I would call fringe thinking, mm -hmm. that people who are excessively optimistic in the face of all facts or people who are excessively pessimistic do tend to be operating from a point of view where they're locked into one position, they're less flexible and they're less able to respond to new information. But what these studies also seem to prove 
which is as obvious as my saying the sun is going to rise tomorrow, presumably, um, is that... <laughs> we'll, we'll see tomorrow. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Uh, what these studies tend to prove is that a certain dose of healthy caution mm -hmm. and a certain dose of healthy optimism when measured in casual short-term circumstances, because that's what these studies are. Make no mistake, many of these studies are conducted over a, a span of two weeks. How much in your life have you ever accomplished in two weeks? You know, I mean, we're coming off of an election that lasted for 18 months. You know, So some of these studies are quite short-term. So short-term, yeah, cautious optimism and, and, and cautious wariness or pessimism or whatever words you want to use, guarded caution, uh, seem to be beneficial ways of thinking, which to me is commonsensical. Mm -hmm. Our interest in our culture is not just managing what's going on for the next two weeks, although we obviously have to do that, but is experimenting with different ways of using our minds, different ways of viewing the creative and causative properties of thought, none of which can be measured casually by some professor or graduate student who him or herself probably doesn't have a great ability to teach or instruct people in any of these methods over a course of two weeks. I write in one of my pieces, only half jokingly, that what these studies may be measuring is the effectiveness of cognitive psychologists as motivational coaches. You know, they seem to be oh, doing no. a pretty poor job. And I mean that only half jokingly, because if you look at the protocol of the experiments, you're going to scratch your head and you're going to wonder just what were they doing? You know, this person was guiding these people in positive visualizations, guiding these people in the uses of affirmations and, you know, positive prayer or what have you. And you'll find that the terminology that they use is very fuzzy, you know, is a given study measuring and, and, and the psychologists themselves or the clinicians themselves sort of get hung up on these terms and definitions. Are they using positive fantasy? Are they using positive visualization? Are they using positive affirmation? But they're not defining the differences between any of those things because those differences are not easily defined because we think our, our imaginative faculty mm -hmm. is visual. It's, it's, our imaginative faculty is inactive of all the five senses. So it's very difficult to draw demarcations between, you know, we're measuring fantasizing versus affirming and what have you. So these studies are a mess and nobody knows they're a mess because nobody's reading them. And the journalists who write about them at the New Yorker and other places are married to a snappy point of view that positive thinking, ha, huh, it's the opposite of what we thought after all these years. And it makes for a neat headline. It makes for a nice lead. It's funny. Uh, it's tantalizing. And it's also completely inaccurate. <laughs> so let's let's go from there. I think we're going to dive into positive psychology. Maybe we'll we'll touch base on on one area where it can be a challenge. And and mm -hmm. this is I, I call this the Dalai Lama effect because when he mm -hmm. first came over here, he noted that o only in the West would people take something positive about turning inward and use it against themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that's one of the areas where positive psychology, the blame game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, po positive psychology as a thought school is it's fairly new, you know, it, 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 as a secular, cognitively based movement. Positive psychology has become popular, say, over the last 30 years mm -hmm. or so. And. Personally speaking, I'm not greatly impressed with positive psychology as a cognitive movement because I think that new thought methods have in various ways reemerged as a secular, non-spiritual thought school many, many times over the past uh, hundred years, mm -hmm. we'll say. We've had movements called psychology of mind. We've had movements called uh, psychology of mood or mood therapy, um, neuro-linguistic programming, um, the program called psycho-cybernetics, which I happen to admire very much, was a bestseller in 1960, is still widely read. There have been many, many different iterations of the 
the new thought challenge, that thoughts are causative, that have been expressed in psychological movements that strip these ideas of their spiritual component. And that's fine. You know, I, I'm a big admirer of psychocybernetics. I like that very, very much. I like what Anthony Robbins offers. I NLP. think psychocybernetics was probably uh, a foundational influence on Robbins, although he won't talk very much about his influences. Um, I'd like to get him talking about his influences. So I like those movements. Um, what, what, what sort of turns me off a bit about positive psychology, and I'm not speaking of any individual therapist. I mean, there are many positive practicing therapists in positive psychology who are wonderful. Um, but kind of the, the founders of the movement, in particular uh, the psychologist um, Martin Seligman, they rush to disassociate themselves from the power of positive thinking as if it's a plague and, and as if it's a mark of unseriousness and something that they need to escape from. And they try to draw distinctions between their rationalistic, action-oriented movement and what they claim is the passive fantasy-based movement represented by figures like Norman Vincent Peale or Rhonda Byrne. But that's all just rhetoric. You know, it's, 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 it's politics of a sort. If you look at methods within the positive thinking movement, literally going back more than a century, literally going back more than a century, you will find non-spiritual or in some cases spiritual methods that are every bit as action-oriented and uh, cognitively constructive as the best ideas today in positive psychology. And I'm a little turned off when people rush to disavow a certain movement. I mean, you never heard Elvis Presley saying, no, rhythm and blues was no influence on me whatsoever. Never heard of it. You know, you never heard the Beatles saying, no, we can't stand Elvis. You know, there are no neat straight lines in the history of ideas. And my feeling is that positive psychology as a movement, particularly as founded by Seligman, and I know he's not the only man involved in it, you know, but I, I think he tends to sort of go out of his way to create this disassociation. I think, you know, it's, it's just sort of apologizing for the floorboards beneath one's feet. Uh, the, the forerunner of that movement is new thought and positive thinking. And if one has a secular point of view, and a person can have both spiritual and secular points of view, none of us are restricted, positive psychology may hold wonderful things. But as a thought movement, I don't find it that impressive. Mm -hmm. I find it one more iteration in a line of many uh, that have rendered new thought principles secular. There are some wonderful positive psychology therapists out there, so I don't want anybody to feel that I'm, I'm putting down the practice in any way. Um, I'm talking more about um, the, the, the kind of political approach that Seligman and some of his contemporaries have taken. Um, that said, I think um, there's also a backlash brewing among cognitive psychologists against positive psychology, frankly, for no reason other than the fact that we as a human uh, community tend to think in phases. We tend to be somewhat conformist. And mm -hmm. as soon as somebody uh, does a study that says something or seems to say something in the media, people rush to imitate it uh, because they want grants and attention and tenure too and all the other good things that come to you when your research uh, attracts attention. So I link to some articles within my piece, the piece that you're referencing, Losing the War on Unhappiness, that go into this some more, somewhat more deeply. Um, but I think that's the dynamic that we're seeing at the moment uh, in all these supposed studies that you may read about uh, in places like Newsweek and The New Yorker that uh, dump on positive thinking as a movement. Thank you. Let's let's go from there and let's let's talk. Let's go back in time a little bit, and I'm going to pronounce their name wrong. Forgive me, uh, Emil Q. Um, oh, Emil Kue. Emil Kue. I wondered if the e yeah. on the end, how we were going to deal Emile with that. Emil Kue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Emil Kue, whose name is is largely forgotten today, but I think many of your listeners will recognize his mantra. Day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better. Kue was a pharmacist in northwestern France in the early 20th century. And he discovered quite by accident that when he spoke in praise of a certain formula, mm -hmm. his patients seemed to respond better to it. 
and he got to thinking about mental conditioning. And after studying hypnotism and various other modalities, Kue came up with a theory and a method called conscious autosuggestion. And Kue believed that through conscious autosuggestion, or what today we might call affirmations, uh, you could, if done right, reprogram uh, your psychological reactions and get your imagination on your side, so to speak. And Kue was fond of pointing out that our perceptions have such an enormous impact on our sense of well-being. And he used this as an example. Kue would say to people that if you take a board and you put it on the ground and you ask somebody, walk across this board, they'll walk across it with no problem. If you take that very same board and elevate it 20 feet off the ground and ask somebody to walk across it, they'll be nervous and you know their fight or flight mechanism will be running wild. Perception controls so much of experience. You'll have no more problem walking across the board 20 feet high on the ground. You'll be fine. But just the perception that something could go wrong is enough to radically and diametrically change our experience of what's going on. So Kue came up with a mantra, day by day, in every way I'm getting better and better, that he felt if used correctly could reprogram your psyche. Kue recommended whispering it gently to yourself 20 times just before falling asleep at night and repeating the same procedure just upon waking up in the morning. And he was on to something that brain science later validated, which is the, the period when we hover between sleep and consciousness, again, just before drifting off at night, just coming to in the morning, is an enormously supple, suggestive state. People are consciously aware at such a state, and yet there's all kinds of things going on in our brains that we don't fully understand, both as individuals and scientifically. We experience hallucinations sometimes during that time. We feel emotions very intensively during that time. People who are suffering from depression or suffering from grief describe the early morning hours as the most difficult hours of the day. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because our we're conscious to some extent. Our emotions are up and running, as always. But our rational thought systems are not fully operative. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of double-edged sword those times of day. We can feel grief very intensely, but we can also use those periods to, in effect, reprogram ourselves. And Kui, Kui had an early, early instinct for this. And so his program was exquisitely simple. He knew that people wouldn't do it if it wasn't simple. But at the same time, it came back to haunt him because his critics said, Nothing that simple can work. That's preposterous. But, of course, they would never try it because it's preposterous. So it becomes this round robin, you know. And so his name has been forgotten, but he was actually a, a huge influence in his day. He died in 1926, did two brief tours of America. He was an influence on a lot of people, including the Beatles, who uh, uh, incorporated his mantra into a couple of their songs. And um, Harvard Medical School recently did a study in which they found that if positive information were conveyed to people about their migraine drugs, the drugs would work better. And that was exactly the same insight that Kue had. And I communicated with uh, the head of Harvard's placebo program, a researcher named Ted Kapchuk, and he, he had heard of Kue, he knew about Kue. Kue hadn't been on his mind as he was devising the study, but he agreed with me that the, the, the insights of the study and Kue's insights could comport. So that's why... I feel that you know nobody in any psychological modality should rush to disassociate themselves mm -hmm. from disreputable figures like Emil Kue or the New Thought tradition because Kue, in fact, had an instinct in the early 20th century for the same thing that Harvard just validated in its, in its study. So there's great value there, and there is a family tree of ideas there, whether we know it or not. I want to keep going down this line of thought, but but this is an un, unplanned detour because a lot Please. of guests have been asking about it. I've been asking about it too, which is when we run up against a wall of an idea in our subconscious, 
And yeah. our affirmations just can't seem to get past that. In fact, the subconscious is heckling us yeah. at that point. How we can use maybe that hypnagogic state, what we can yeah. do to blast through that wall or to negotiate through the wall or to do anything past it? That is a wonderful question, Michael, and I really appreciate it. And this is one of these instances where I want to be very blunt and frank with you and your listeners because I would be lying to you guys and I would be misleading you guys if I didn't tell you that I have those exact same issues myself. And I carry with myself psychological baggage that I may take to my grave. I am 50 years old and any self-help guru who sits in front of you with complete confidence telling you, oh, here's what to do about that, is engaged in a game of theater. I care enormously about the New Thought tradition. It runs through my blood. I experiment with it. I believe with all my heart that the mind has creative and causative properties that we haven't even begun to understand. And I believe that consciousness may ultimately, ultimately be the engine of reality. And I would never say that in some pithy or offhanded way. At the same time, I have experienced those blockages myself. And I, I want to say several things. Number one, it's very important that we as a New Thought community work together on these questions mm -hmm. and that nobody play make-believe, including me, and say, well, here's what you do. Here's a method. It's just fine. You know, it's, it's not just fine. I mean, these are big questions, and we as a community need to be honest with one another and work through them. What I would say is, first of all, in the short term, when you're trying to use affirmations in the face of a greatly difficult block, I would say, stop, stop. There is a time and a season for everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to allow ourselves to use affirmations when the mind and the emotions and the body are all cooperating with us. There are times, frankly, where I think, we have to, you know, watch a movie or go for a bike ride or whatever it is you, you like doing and, and just stop trying because we can't fight against certain emotional tendencies in ourselves at certain moments. And I think it's best to do affirmations when your mind is on your side. There are currents of energy in us that we don't understand mm -hmm. and we shouldn't try to fight those. But I'm speaking short term. You know, this is saying you're in a bad mood Saturday at eight o'clock. OK, you know, watch Star Trek, whatever. Maybe you'll be in the mood Sunday at four o'clock. I'm speaking short term. The long term question is tougher. And I think that that requires a lifetime of experimentation. Yes, I think one should try to use the hypnagogic state. I think that's very important. Again, it's very simple. The hypnagogic state is a sleep induced state where you might experiencing it not only at night in the morning, you might experience it if you are meditating and you drift off. People fall asleep when they're meditating sometimes. And I think that's natural. That's the body sort of taking what it needs. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, in transcendental meditation, for example, the meditation tradition that I practice, if the body needs sleep, it will take it when you're meditating and that's going to happen. So you may experience this hypnagogic state in the afternoon, to, use to, it. To pause Experiment. you, I, I, I don't recall, I don't believe it's Emerson. I don't remember which person it was. What, um, maybe it was even Young who, who would, w would it be almost going into a napping state? I, I wish I remembered more of this, like propping themselves up or holding something in their hand. And if that dropped to, to wake themselves back up, but in that state right before they're falling asleep while they're holding something, that's, that's where they were trying to get to. Just yes, ringing a bell. yes, exactly. I don't know that particular story. That's very interesting about the thing in their hand falling and waking them up. Um, I do know that the person in the New Thought tradition who I most admire, Neville Goddard, mm -hmm. he would talk about going into this drowsy sleep state around 3 o'clock just after lunch and that that was a state of prime creativity for him. So I would encourage people to experiment with the hypnagogic state as I do. Let me know what you find. Experiment with different forms of, you know, really conscious auto-suggestion was really just a waking hypnosis. And Kuei would have acknowledged that. It is a waking conscious hypnosis that you do on yourself. 
So whenever you're in a state of exquisite relaxation, mm -hmm. you are probably in or entering this so-called hypnagogic state. And when you're in that state, you can perform on yourself the same thing that a hypnotherapist might perform. And that might involve whispering an affirmation, whispering a prayer. Kue advised taking a piece of string, nodding it 20 times, and counting off your affirmations on the knotted piece of string as if you're using a rosary bead so that you're not employing your rational mind. You're not distracted with counting. You can also just count off on your fingers. You know, there, there are different methods you can use. And I think these things can be a form of help to psychological blocks. I also think that different modalities of meditation can be a help to psychological blocks. I think there, there, there are many different modalities of meditation. My particular choice is transcendental meditation. Another practice that I engage in that I think can be a help to psychological blocks is the chanting of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, which I'm sure some of your viewers know. That's the chant of Nichiren uh, Buddhism. And it's very beautiful, and I think over the long term, very powerful. There's a um, there's a video online. Um, What's love got to do with it? Tina Turner. That's right. There's a video of Tina Turner doing that online. It's just That's beautiful. Right. She swears by the practice. She swears by the practice, and uh, there's a lot of beautiful videos that you can find about it just by putting the chant Nam Yoho Renge Kyo into your search engine. And if you need help spelling that out, just write to me, and I'll send it to you. <laughs> um, so, you know, th there are these different practices that I think we can use. And I, I also think, frankly, that breaking down a psychological barrier, dealing with a psychological barrier, however one wants to put it, there are people who don't like, you know, the language I use, breaking down and things like that. There, there's different ways to approach it. But we're all seeking the same thing. The, 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 another, I, I think, perhaps the key thing is the wanting, the absolute, deep, profound wish without any internal contradiction whatsoever for this barrier to be incorporated into your life, dealt with, digested in a way that's constructive, whatever that means. You know, but I think that wanting is extremely important because we don't always want what we say we want. And I think we have to be brutally frank with ourselves about that and that what, can also what do you, take like what do you mean given if you sorry sorry to interrupt this is this is huge you've written yeah. about this a, a bunch yeah. and it is so powerful what do yeah. you mean we don't really want what we think we want i i feel that very deeply and i think we have to look at that in ourselves i'll give you a, you know first an, an example mm -hmm. there's a woman i used to know who was single um very funny very appealing person and she she vowed that she wanted to meet a guy. She wanted to be in a committed, steady relationship. And this was her absolute objective. But week after week after week after week, she would tell stories about all these weirdos and goofballs that she went out with. And he did this and he did that. And after a while, I got to suspect that she really didn't want what she said she wanted because why would you be going out on date after date after date with all these evidently weird guys? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, we claim not to know. Well, how was I going to know this? How was I going to know that? You know, how would I know that he would, you know, show up wearing whatever, you know, but we know, we know, you know, we're pretty, we're, we're, we're more mature and, and scrutinizing and wise and shrewd, frankly, than we give ourselves credit for being. And I think when someone's actions are persistently at odds with what they say they want, I mean, we owe it to ourselves as individuals to scrutinize that. Now, the, the great spiritual teacher Krishnamurti in the mid-1960s mm -hmm. was giving a series of talks to a group of young Indian students. And one of the students said to him, I was just thinking about this this morning, one of the students said to him, how can we enact the ideas that you're talking about? Krishnamurti was talking to them about how important it is to cultivate a sense of independence, to be nonconformist, mm -hmm. to go one's own way, to think for oneself. He was talking about the importance of sort of, sorry, excuse me, it's time for my 3 p.m. prayer, which is what I had my phone set for. I say a prayer every day at 3 p.m. You know, but we will we, save that for the end of the show. 
Um, is that all right, or would it be good to put a put a? I don't know what you do for a prayer. No, it's it's fine. I think um, uh, I think it'll be a maximum benefit for us to save it to the end of the show. Perfect. Um, so Krishnamurti was asked by a student, how can we put into practice these things that you're telling us? And Krishnamurti said to the student, look, if you were walking down the road and you saw a cobra, you wouldn't ask, how can I get away from that cobra? You'd know how to get away from that cobra, and you would. We only ask how when we don't really want to do something. Mm. And people immediately want to argue with that. They immediately want to push back on that. But he said, he went on to say to the student, when you want to play cricket, this is India, so he was speaking of cricket. When you want to get away from your studies and play cricket, you don't ask how. You find a way to go and play cricket. You have no problem getting away and doing that. You know? And he said, you know, it's, it's when we don't really want to do something that we say how, how, how. And this one young man said to him, may have been part of the same session, that he wanted to be an engineer, but that his father said to him, if he pursued his studies in engineering, he would throw him out of the house, that he wanted the young man instead to go into his business, join the father in his business. And he said, you know, but his, his dream, his passion was to become an engineer. But he, you know, here he was living with this threat of being thrown out of his home. What should he do? And Krishnamurti said to him, sir, listen to me. Life is very strange. When we determine what we want to do with absolute certainty, mm -hmm. things come to our aid. Things come to our benefit. Do you think you'll be thrown out? Do you think you'll be on the street? Do you think you'll be a beggar? Someone will help you, an auntie, a grandmother, a classmate. You'll see someone will come to your assistance. But the only way that you can find that and that you can discover that is to have an idea to which you're absolutely committed and act upon it. And strange things happen. So knowing what you really want and you know being prepared to act on it I think is the single most important factor in dealing with a psychological block, whether it's an addiction or something else. And, you know, take that student as a case in point. I don't know who that young man was, but what was his dream? Okay. What did he want more? Did he want to be an engineer or did he want security? I'm not putting down either one. You know, security is valuable. Okay. Okay. So maybe the young man wanted security more than he wanted to be an engineer. Well, then he would bend to his father's wishes. But we have to ask ourselves, what do we really want? And not trust ourselves at whatever rote answer comes to mind. Because people are apt to say, of course I know what I want. Or people are apt to say, you know, I'd like to be a trapeze artist, but how can I blah, 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 blah. We always want to argue with this, but we never want to actually sit down and say, look, what if that's true? And... Life strikes a strange bargain with us. It usually gives us just one thing. So we have to decide what is that one thing that we want more than anything else. So the, the wanting, it is more important than I can possibly give words to. Knowing that you want to overcome that barrier or whatever it may be is the single greatest determinant in whether you will. Thank you. I, I do a lot of coaching here, and, and I'm known for scaring away coaching clients because I really want to, I want to ferret out how badly do they want it, which is, it's, it's actually, it's, yeah. it's ironic because if they want it badly enough, they don't really need my help. That's right. <laughs> Conversely. You'll, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. No, no. You'll, yeah, you'll put yourself out of business, right? Yeah. If they want it badly enough, they will, mountains will move. Bingo. Yeah. And if they yeah. don't want it badly enough, I can't move a big enough mountain for them awesome. ever. Right. Right. And it's rare. You know, it's unfortunate, but it's the way it is. You know, it's, it's rare that life will give us two things. Like, I want to be a trapeze artist, but I also want security. You know, those are both valid things. And I'm not putting down security. You know, I want security. If that's what you want, that's what you'll get. And it might not include certain other things. Uh, and it's, it can be tough. It can be tough. But that's why the, the, what one really wants, one must get in touch with that because what you want is very, very likely what you're going to get. It's just that we don't know it. We're kind of oblivious to it. Thank you. From there, I want to want to go back in time real briefly and share an example from your past when you wanted something very badly and you started reading Ralph Waldo Emerson, Talmudic Guide. You moved, your family moved, if I understand, from Queens yep. 
to Long Island to yeah. a house you couldn't afford. Right, right. And shortly after we moved in, my father lost his job and we were facing economic disaster. And it was very, very, very painful. I mean, there were no presents at you know, Christmas time or Hanukkah. We had to heat the house with kerosene heaters because we couldn't afford to heat it. Um, I used to wear used clothing. We would buy secondhand used clothing. And it was, it was you know, middle class poverty is very hard because you're trying to hide it, you know, from everybody at the same time. And uh, it was a very difficult way of life. Um, and I, I knew that I needed some source of support and help. And so I, I voraciously read in, I guess, what you'd call practical philosophies, uh, a book called The Ethics of the Fathers, which is a section of the Talmud, uh, later Emerson and, and other figures. And I was looking for a way to, I was looking for a workaday philosophy that could be used to navigate through life at a time when life was very, very frightening and figure out how could I get to the point where I was no longer in this terrible state of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And eventually our family was able to move on and eventually things, things worked out. Um, after, you know, there was still a great deal of pain, but, uh, I was able to go away to a state college and uh, get on with my life in ways that were, in some respects, a dream come true. And so that adolescent period was a time of great influence for me and probably planted the seed that's continued today in my search for practical, workable, spiritual philosophies. And I think that crises do push us sometimes to points where we are forced to search without and within, and one never necessarily wants to go through a crisis. You don't wish it upon yourself or other people, but I think that, uh, well, the basketball player, Jeremy Lin, puts it in an interesting way. He's a very yeah. religious guy, and I just admire him very deeply. And you know, he puts it very simply, if we didn't lose, we would never get better. We would never get better. And you know, people think, oh, great. You know, that's what you got for me. That sounds like a refrigerator magnet. It is so true. It goes down to the core of existence. It's just that we can't see it when we're going through the suffering. We want the suffering to end. I want the suffering to end. And the suffering has to end. I mean, you can't perpetually go through life um, parched. You know, at, at a certain point, water needs to touch your lips. But it might come about in a way that's very surprising and very unusual and summon up resources and circumstances in you that, that you never knew you possessed or that you never knew could course through you. So that's what adolescence was for me. It was the beginning of a search and a journey that grew out of very scary uh, life circumstances. I think we're all, we're all benefiting from that search that you've undertaken because that's kind of pointed you on your life's path. Yeah, well, knock wood. I, 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 I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I think uh, that's true for all of us in various ways. Can you tell us from there, can you tell us, we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit of, of real world stuff we can do. Roy yeah. Jarrett and the three-step miracle. Right, right. I love Roy Jarrett. Uh, Roy was a Chicago salesman mm -hmm. uh, who lived in the early 20th century who anonymously wrote a little pamphlet that some of your listeners may know called It Works. And I discovered It Works about 10 years ago. I've probably given away hundreds of copies at this point. Um, it Works is a little 28-page pamphlet Roy published, self-published by himself in 1926 in Chicago. And it, it, it lays out basically a three-step program for achievement. The three steps are exquisitely simple. Here they are. One, devise a list of what you really want out of life and be really painstaking about it. Revise it, go over it and over it. Make sure you have it right. This touches on what you and I were just discussing, mm -hmm. this idea that you really have to come to terms with what you want, whatever it is, and you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Okay, so you've devised your list. Two, read your list three times a day. Evening, I would recommend following the Kue method of reading it just before you go to sleep at night, uh, midday, and morning, just as you're coming to in the morning, and carry your list with you. Think about it all the time. 
You don't have to just restrict yourself to reading your list in the evening, midday, and morning. Carry it with you on a mm -hmm. laminated card or in a notebook or whatever. Read it constantly. And then three, tell no one what you're doing. Keep it silent. This is your practice. This is your experiment. It's private. A friend used to joke to me, it's like uh, the, the, the movie and, and book Fight Club. Rule one, no one talks about Fight Club, if anybody remembers the movie. Um, but it's true. There's truth to it. This is your sacred private experiment. When you talk to other people, a lot of people wonder why. What's the point? Why did he say don't talk to anybody? He never elucidates what, what his reasoning is for that. But I think what his reasoning is that is that other people, including people very close to us, they run down our ambitions. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're jealous. Maybe they feel bitterness about their own unresolved aims and goals, and they don't want to see somebody else uh, sprint ahead of them, so to speak. People make a practice of running down other people. It also gives people a kind of perverse thrill, whatever the psychology is behind it. It's sound advice. Mm -hmm. So keep your list to yourself. And then express gratitude as good things come to you. Express gratitude. Don't entertain doubts. Don't tell yourself, it would have happened anyway. It was a coincidence. Remember, this is an experiment. Follow the experiment if you want to. Express gratitude. So that's the three-step miracle, as I call it. You devise your list, and you do it very painstakingly and with absolute intense honesty. Two, read it morning, noon, night. Carry it with you. Three, tell no one. And then finally, express gratitude when good things come to you. And I joke with people, you know, as though to say, that's it? You know, how could something so simple possibly work? Because it pushes us to do something that we think we're doing all the time, but that we very rarely ever try, which is to come to terms with our deepest desires and see what happens. See what happens. You can interpret it psychologically. You can interpret it spiritually. You can interpret it both ways. I interpret it both ways. But the important thing is it's your experiment. My conclusions don't matter. Try the experiment. Now, if any of your listeners uh, email me, and I'm mm -hmm. super easy to find, just throw my name into Google. You'll never be able to get rid of me. Um, I'll send them a little card that has these instructions uh, written out on it. Very, very simple to follow. That's a practical method that I would recommend to anyone. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to go over a few of your daily practices before I do, and, and then we'll start to wrap things up. Before I do that, sure. uh, I, I'm writing a a book. It's it's not not this Tolstoy or anything, but a book on yeah. gratitude right now. And Wonderful. I'm wondering what to you is the importance, since you were touching on it here, of gratitude. That's an interesting question. I think gratitude, it, first of all, it serves the purposes of our morale. It allows us to make note of the fact that there's been movement, that something has happened. Individuals need that. Nations need that. Uh, cultures need that. If you lose that, you do develop a sense of morbidity around life. Um, and I think that avoiding that sense of morbidity and maintaining your sense of morale that actually circumstances can be responsive to thought is just extremely, extremely important. And I also think that if one takes a spiritual view of life, which I do, the opening of one's existence, the raising of one's sails, so to speak, to the influence of something higher seems to be enacted by gratitude. So I think there are many levels on which it's just an extremely important practice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's realistic. I, I mean, I think that to not engage in gratitude is to overlook things in as much as you'd be overlooking things by driving with your headlights off. I mean, we know that intelligent caution makes sense. You know, there are certain things you do when you go swimming. There are certain things you do when you drive. You put in your seatbelt. No thinking person wouldn't do that. And I think gratitude is sort of the same practice. There's a, there's a realism in it. There are things to be grateful for. And uh, I mean, those are just some of the dimensions. 
of why I think it's so important. Yeah, and, and I, I like that concept of, of seat belting. And for me, the part of that safety or that seat belt is literally when you give gratitude, when you give thanks for something, you tend to bring more of it about. Yes, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. So if you were to, to throw caution to the wind and not put the seat belt on and go, <laughs> ah, I did one, whatever. Right, then right. <laughs> that whatever may be what you get. Right. Right, right. I think that's very right. I think that's very true. So, can you tell us about your, your morning connection, what you do in the morning? Well, I uh, wake up in the morning, and I think it's very important for all of us to make some connection to our highest ideals before we pick up the iPhone and get started with the business of the day. So that can take several different forms. One form it can take is using Emil Kue's affirmation that we talked about, I also have a card on Kuwe, so if your listeners write to me, I'll, I'll flood them with cards. <laughs> I could give them a card with that little practice on it. Um, so wake up in the m morning, or just as you're coming to in the morning, you could say Emil Kuwe's uh, affirmation. You could say the Lord's Prayer. You could say the traditional uh, Jewish prayer, which is, um, I thank thee, O living and eternal King, for thou hast graciously restored my soul to me. Great is thy faithfulness. There's a humility in that prayer that I like very, very much. Um, you could chant Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. You could say the prayer of Jabez, uh, which I think is a wonderful practice. Um, there's any number of things you can do in the morning, but before you get sucked into media, TV, the phone, the news, the to-do list, whatever it is, I think it's, it's very important to connect with your highest ideals, whether in a secular sense, whether in a religious sense, or, or both. Thank you. What would be another one key practice that you do throughout the day that, that uh, I, I, even saying to recommend to people is strange because it's very personal, but one that works for you? Well, one that works for me is this. Um, my phone just conveniently went off before, and um, uh, I set my phone uh, at 3 p.m., each day mm -hmm. to uh, take a few moments of prayer. Now, in Christian tradition, Christ is said to have died on the cross at 3 p.m., and uh, within Catholicism, there's a practice called uh, the Divine Mercy Devotion, which I very highly recommend to people, and part of that devotion involves viewing 3 p.m. as the hour of divine mercy and using that as a time to say a rosary, say a prayer, just take a few moments out of the day for reflection, meditation, prayer. 3 p.m. in the divine mercy devotion mm -hmm. is called the hour of divine mercy. In fact, it's so funny, forgive me for uh, getting distracted, but there's a little... Um, there are these pamphlets, I'm just filled with propagation today. I like uh, it. Yeah, called the, the the Hour of Great Mercy. And if anybody writes to me, I you, will. You can hold that up maybe you. halfway back, a little back further. Ah, uh, yes. So that it's not yeah. in the glare. The Hour of Divine Mercy. I will mail one of these to you personally. Yeah. Or I will photograph it and send you a JPEG or a, a PDF. It's so funny. I was just cleaning out some bookshelves. Uh, couple of days before our talk here, and I realized I, I had collected some of these pamphlets with the intention of giving them away. So uh -huh. um, flood me with emails, and I'll, I'll send you one. <laughs> and, um, if you're really nice, I may send you a copy of It Works as well. I, I tend to propagate. You know, I'd be very good in propagating religions. I'm good at setting up chairs and propagating. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like um, it, Mitch. <laughs> um, so, so I set 3 p.m. on my phone mm -hmm. uh, for a time of daily prayer. And I would invite everyone listening to join me in this at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Unless I'm interrupted for some unforeseen reason, like, like I'm in the me. middle of an interview and I can't just you know make everybody wait, or unless there's a medical emergency or something, every single day uh, I will be praying. And I'll pray for you if you write to me and you need something. If someone's sick or if someone's looking for work or whatever it is, just write to me. You know, I mean, I, I, I will pray for people at 3 p.m. each day, every day, 3 p.m. Eastern time. You can join in or you cannot join in. 
I'll do it. It's on my phone. It goes off every day. And I, it's a privilege. It is a privilege. So let me know if you need a prayer. And I will be very, very happy uh, to say one for you on a given day or over a series of days. Um, so that's a practice that I abide by. And I would invite everyone to join in. It's non-denominational. It doesn't matter what your belief system is. And if you're secular and don't have a spiritual belief system, then just take it as a few moments to meditate and connect with some of, some, some, some of your highest ethical ideals. That's all. But I think it's wonderful. And we all can take a few moments out of the day at that time, almost wherever you are and whatever you're doing. It's a very interesting time. And you mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the, the, the hypnagogic state. Yes, 3 p.m. Exactly. tends to be energetically a very interesting time. That's very interesting you say that because Neville, Neville Goddard, wrote that he tended to go into his sort of trance states, his meditative states at 3 p.m. He said he felt a certain drowsiness after lunch, and I thought, wow, that's exactly the same time as this Bingo. hour of divine mercy. And, and, and it's interesting. Yeah, I, I think people do have that association, you know. So, so let's, let me just ask a few quick wrap-up questions, then we'll jump into a, a, a brief prayer or meditation or whatever you're sure. called here. Um, first off, um, my wife, Jessica, producer, always likes me to ask a question for kids or for parents for kids. So yeah. any words of wisdom for parents for their kids or having to do with positive thought, new thought, anything? Well, I would say this, as the father of two sons who rebel against me at every possible moment. How old? <laughs> uh, nine and 12. <laughs> They'll say things to me like, you know, Bigfoot isn't real and ESP is nonsense. <laughs> Don't you dare talk that way in this house. <laughs> I had this little box of Bigfoot Band-Aids here. I have one of them on my bike helmet. I don't know if your your viewers will be able to see it, but I had this box of Bigfoot Band-Aids. Yeah. And uh, I said to my older son, um, now, who wouldn't want a Bigfoot Band-Aid? And he said to me, scientists. So that's how they rebel against me. <laughs> so, but I would say this, and I try to remember this myself, and if you, you, other folks out there, caregivers, parents, teachers, can remember it with me, I'd appreciate it. Um, kids are influenced by us, even when they pretend to be ignoring us. They hear it with, they, we, say, we say they value our opinions, they want our approval, even if they don't overtly show it. So when a child, especially an adolescent, seems to be turning away from you, seems to be ignoring you, seems to be perpetually rolling his or her eyes at you, it's a natural rebellion that has to happen. It's them sort of testing the boundaries of their own freedom and sort of straining at the leash, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But... Kids are more influenced by the adults around them and want the approval of the adults around them than they would ever let on. And not letting on is almost a stage of growth and testing and rebellion that's necessary. They're, they're finding their own sense of independence. And, and yet, emotionally, they're still kids. Emotionally, they're still kids. And they care very deeply about and think about and even repeat things that you say and, and they want your approval. So don't let their outer pose fake you out. They still very much want your approval and, and they hear what you say. Thank you. So, so basically at those ages or at any ages, realize they're watching you. <laughs> They are watching you, and you'll be surprised. There'll be moments when you overhear them talking to friends or on the phone or whatever, and they'll repeat something that you've said, and you'll be quite surprised because you'll think it just kind of went in one ear and out the other, but that's not the case. Thank yeah. you so much. From there, a question we like to ask all our guests just before the end. What personally brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? <laughs> um, I think the the interacting and communicating within our alternative spiritual culture, you know, finding ways of reaching people, finding ways of taking practical, workable spiritual ideas, bringing them to people, having people bring to me responses, experiments, questions, experiences, working together that way, exchanging together that way, and feeling that I have been able to 
communicate and get across an idea in a way that is authentically useful. And that, that turns me on enormously. And that is a huge woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> where can people go? You mentioned about emailing you. Where can people go to find out more, to find your book, One Simple Idea, and everything that you have? Yeah, thank you. I'm super easy to find. You just throw my name into Google. It'll take you to my website. That has lots of links, links to my books, lectures, articles, talks, all kinds of things. My email is there if you want to reach out to me. It's actually my real, authentic email. And uh, I'm, I'm easy to find. If you just throw my name into Google or if you go to MitchHorowitz.com, you'll be plugged in. Fantastic. And if you're driving down the road and you didn't catch Mitch Horowitz, I should do that sublimity, Mitch Horowitz, Mitch Horowitz, Mitch Horowitz. But if you didn't <laughs> catch that, come on over to InspireNationShow.com. We'll get over get you over to Mitch as well. So thank you so much. Before we dive thank into a, a prayer here, any last words of wisdom you want to share with people, maybe particularly on this day? Uh, I would say I would like to share these following words. You know, if you take something from this show, let it today, let it be this. Search for what you really authentically desire inside and being able to place your finger on that can put you in a place of enormous vitality and power. Um, and we spend a lot of time telling ourselves what we want rather than really scrutinizing whether we're repeating things to ourselves by rote, by habit, by conditioning, by peer influence, throw out the playbook, throw out the playbook and consider from a totally fresh perspective what you want in life. And some of the exercises that we've discussed today, in particular, the, the three step miracle or the it works program can be a wonderful method in, in embarking on that journey. But Really ask yourself with complete honesty, uh, a lack of preconception and total unembarrassed maturity. Remember, this is private. You don't have to please anybody. What do you really want in life? That's huge. Yeah. Thank you so much. So Thank you. This has been fantastic. Do you, do you have a, uh, a prayer or something you'd like to share with us now? Yes. Um, I, I think I'd like to do a a kind of group prayer and meditation. Um, we heard the bell ring at three, and it's now past three, but I think it's it's appropriate to do it. It's three somewhere. Well, it's 2.30 somewhere, but it will be when people listen. It'll be three somewhere right. in the world. Speaking from Eastern time. <laughs> but, uh, okay, let's just sit back and relax. Close our eyes, please. Take a few deep breaths. I'd like us to do a prayer together that is a slightly expanded version of the prayer of Jabez, something that many of you have heard of, something that many of you may have tried. This may be a return to that practice for some people. It may mark the start of the practice. I think it's a very valuable prayer, and I offer it to you either as a prayer or a meditation or a statement of ethics, whatever you're most at ease with. And I'm going to offer a brief comment on each short line of the prayer as we embark on it together. Oh God, that you would bless me indeed. I think it's very important to ask for God's blessings and not to assume that that's self-centered or that that's narrow. We, all of us, are here as creators. We are told that we are in the image of the creator and asking to be vital, to be of use, to be functioning at your highest God-given abilities, I think is a very sound and good and valid thing to do.
and that you would expand my territories. Again, asking God, asking spirit, asking a higher power, however you see it, asking that your plans and hopes be seen, be constructed well, be carried to fruition, that your borders and your abilities be as expansive as possible, I think befits the dignity that, that is our birthright as creative, intelligent beings. And that you would be with me always. You're asking a higher power. You're asking God to be with you always, knowing that none of us is disconnected from the other. None of us can function in a solitary, isolated manner. We need constantly an influx of insight, of ethics, of intelligence, so that we don't just fall into habit or reaction. And keep me far from evil. However you see evil, is evil an addiction? Is evil the influence of a person who torments you and who you need to vow to get away from? first spiritually, mentally, and later or as soon as possible physically? Or is evil an influence that would mislead you, drag you into doing something that is destructively selfish, short-sighted, harmful? Asking that you be kept from evil, I think, is the cornerstone of ethical functioning and ethical achievement. That I may cause no pain. Again, you're emphasizing the need for your comings and goings in life to be wise, to be without violence, to be without foolishness and short-sightedness, to not be a force that harms or drags down other people, but that your daily commerce in the greatest sense of that word should be generative and productive and good. So again, the full prayer is, oh God, that you would bless me indeed, that you would expand my territories and be with me always and keep me far from evil that I may cause no pain. And let's take a deep breath and open our eyes and rejoin one another. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to do that with your listeners. Thank you, Mitch. That was, uh, seemed to be using the word huge a lot today. I'm not sure why. It's <laughs> not, not regularly part of my vernacular, but, but <laughs> it's, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was, um, that was much deeper than it seems on the surface. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I really like that practice. Um, I know that that book, Prayer of Jabez, was very popular for a while, many years ago, and it kind of seemed to come and go, and people thought of it as this trend, but I think it's a wonderful, wonderful book, wonderful prayer, a lot of value there, a lot of depth there, and uh, I'm privileged to be able to participate in it with you all. Well, thank you so much, Mitch. This has been fantastic having you on the show. I know we, we've got you as a repeat guest coming up a few more times in, in the yeah, future. Yeah, I love what we talk about. I, I love 
everything that I don't even know probably a fractional amount of what you're working on. It seems like, I don't know, every third, fourth, <laughs> fifth book I pick up, you're in it, on it, edited it, or wrote it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I like what I'm doing and it helps. <laughs> yeah. You know, Thank we, you. I'd Thank say we you. should all be so lucky, but we can all at least work toward that direction. Amen. Amen. Yeah, for real. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get one simple idea, and crank up your positivity, and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you, man. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Oh, good. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>